I was truly honored when John Baldacchino accepted my invitation late spring uh, in 2021. Um, as an educationist, Baldacchino is widely published, as Michelle has highlighted, and a, a firm believer of being on the ground in his teaching. Um, in addition to everything Michelle has introduced about him, we're truly honored that he's part of our guest lecture series this year. So welcome, John. Let's go back to the beginning. When did your interest in arts education begin to emerge in your studies? So, um, as, as you probably have, you know, surmised from my surname, um, Baldacchino, um, I'm actually Maltese, not Italian, but um, the, um, so basically the whole, the whole idea of where the arts and education came together for me was back in the 80s when, um, you know, coming out of secondary school, I, I found myself, you know, saying, what am I going to do with myself? And I, um, I went to the University of Malta. And in those days, the University of Malta had, um, you know, professionalized all its degrees. We're talking about the 80s here. And um, so my interests were always basically the same, philosophy, art, and education. And, uh, well, education was a bit kind of out there in the, in the background. It was more of a practical thing. What would I do with this stuff? So I found myself in the Faculty of Education in Malta um, as one of the first um, art education um, students. I mean, they, they launched actually the art education program with two of us. So we, we used to go to, to the, now it's tribes as a program, but in those days they tried it at last. So we were a bit of guinea pigs and we went, we used to go to the art, to the professor's studios rather than having studios in the university and all of that. It was quite an interesting um, degree because it was quite a big degree, you know, ran for five years. In America, they would probably call it double major. Because what it did is we focused on being teachers, but also we focused on the, the, the main subject, uh, which was art and art history, practice and history. But also we had the, um, the, the second subject, which was early in the year. So we were equipped to teach both in primary schools and secondary schools. So, so that was the first, that's where it started. And in a way, actually, I kept kind of moving between the three. And um, it started having a bit more of a pronounced kind of, I mean, even though I was teaching, I taught as a teacher in Malta as an art teacher, but the penny dropped as an arts education specialist when I went to Warwick. And that's where, um, you know, I worked with Ken and, and others. So, so that's so what it started. That's an interesting foray in terms of having that double major and the, the double strand of knowing your craft, but also thinking about arts in education. And of course, you mentioned Ken Robinson. Um, you've had several mentors, but particularly landing at Warwick University and working with Professor Ken Robinson. Um, how did Robinson's influence manifest itself through your approach to arts education? Again, it's interesting because that was the 90s. Ken had become, started to make a name for himself because he was the editor of the Gubenkian Report in those days. And that had to do with the arts and education in Britain. So, I mean, I, although Malta was a British colony, we always had that kind of, um, you know, I mean, it became independent when I was born in 64, but I mean, that strong British influence was always there. In fact, the degree that we did in Malta was pretty much the a replica of, of the degree that was done in um, the um, Institute of Education, because we had a lot of people who studied there. So we did philosophy, sociology, and psychology of education, and all the other stuff. So when we went, and also we read British books mostly. So going to Britain, there was a, a strange kind of um, sense of familiarity, even though I never lived there. I never been there except for a holiday. So it was very odd. I mean, you know, we were brought up reading Peter and Jane. Those of us who are my age would remember those Ladybird books. So, I mean, uh, <laughs> it's kind of strange. And I think even taught, I used to teach li little ones still using those books, which is very bizarre. There are a lot of studies in that. But I mean, what's interesting is that going to Britain and thinking that I knew the system, I didn't. And uh, so immediately it was a very kind of, you know, steep curve trying to understand what's going on in arts education there, but also working with this guy whom I didn't even know who he was at first. And then I realized everyone's telling me, well, Ken Robinson is, you know, the big, the, the big thing and uh, because his, his new thing has come out, his book and everything. But I was also working with Fred Inglis, who was very much focused on uh, cultural studies and he, he, he studied with Raymond Williams. So I was quite lucky working with these two people who actually were carrying on their shoulders, if you like, coming from very deep traditions in the British um, education system then. But only now when looking back, especially, uh, do I realize what an exciting time it was because we had at Warwick University, which was one of these new universities of the 60s, 
having a very interdisciplinary in those days, interdisciplinary um, kind of uh, culture. And then I became, you know, a lecturer, what they call here, associate assistant professor, uh, and working there. In two years, then Ken became my boss. So first he was my, my kind of, you know, he was the head of department and we were working and I was a doctor student. And then suddenly he became my boss, I applied for a job and I became a lecturer of arts and design education. So, so it was quite interesting working with him even though my professor for the PhD was Fred, I was also working with Ken a lot, partly because they were running this arts education MA and I used to attend it and they used to engage with the seminars and Ken used to give the seminars as Fred and others. I mean, you know, they used to bring all sorts of people there, which was really interesting. And um, it was quite an interesting place because also there were a lot of teachers who worked in, in Coventry in the Midlands who were doing these MAs. So I was working with people who were in the field out there and soon there, soon, basically, I found myself even going around in Coventry schools, looking and observing teachers because I became part of, I started teaching, you know, teacher training as well. So there was quite an interesting uh, um, relationship with Ken because he was both my mentor as an academic mentor, but also he was my boss. Um, second year, I, you know, I started working with him. So, and at that time, there were a lot of challenges coming up, uh, particularly because there were cuts in, in, in the arts we tried to reinvent. So, I mean, in the seven years that I spent there as, um, as an academic, I don't know how many times we reinvented the program in arts education. Uh, and that was always led by Ken. Ken was kind of helping us in a way, protecting the arts as far as, they, as we could. So sometimes in difficult situations because, um, you know, governments change policies and all that stuff. So, so it was quite interesting. And for those, you know, listening in and sort of getting a sense of an academic who's moving across different cultures, I'm going to move into a very different territory as an academic nomad. I'm going to call you an academic nomad. I like that term. When you moved to New York City uh, to work as an associate professor at Columbia University's Teachers College, you had another mentor, Maxine Green. In your introduction to your book, Education Beyond Education, published in 2009, you write about Green's critic, uh, uh, critic of, of arts uh, education made benign by a liberal and a liberal rendition. In the introduction, you write, this does not happen because teachers and or others cannot engage with philosophy, the arts or literature, but because the vantage points of education are often constrained by the reified knowledge that consigned the study of education to a domain of measure that bears no regard for science, the arts or humanities. A lot to think about there, but whilst keeping those thoughts in mind, could we talk a little bit about your writing on certainly the role of Maxine Green within your formative years in New York City? It's interesting because one of the reasons I got hired at Teachers College was that there was a colleague called Graham Sullivan, and you might know his name because he wrote a lot about arts as a form of research. So one of his book, actually, his, his book became kind of, you know, quite, it's very widely used in, uh, even in, in nursing schools where they're talking about arts as research. And, and he was Australian. So when, when I you know, popped in there um, in my applications and they saw my background and also especially working with Ken, Ken Robinson. It was interesting because the setup there was slightly different because even though it was in America, the, the head of the, 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 you know, Judy Burton was, was British, um, well, still is, and, and um, you know, Graham was Australian. And then there was this kind of New York situation, which was a bit of a bubble compared to say, when, when you look at arts education, say elsewhere in America. But also this whole experience that I had in Britain. And as I said, you know, Ken, you can talk, we can talk about Ken, Ken Robinson's influence actually for, for many hours, partly because um, the whole idea of how the arts survived or they didn't in schools actually in, in a British setup became interesting in hand how then you can translate that in America. There were similarities, but there were very different um, you know, stark differences there. But definitely one of the things which, which was constant and is still constant my 30 years working within the arts and education in both the United States and in Britain, because remember I went back to Dundee, Scotland, which is another story. Um, but there's always this thing about the pressure for the arts to be instrumentalized, but also to legitimize themselves within schools in a way that actually 
I always think that they take away the, the autonomy from schools. So for me, at some point, I got really kind of, you know, I was already coming out of Britain with all those cuts and all the stuff, which basically happened that you know, got precipitated even by, by both kinds of government. Because remember, I was there when John Major was prime minister and then Tony Blair came in and all that stuff. And Ken was the, the, the arts czar for, for Blair's government. And he wrote several documents there. And then coming into America, uh, at a time where, you know, had George Bush and then we had um, obviously Barack Obama. But and so the politics is important because that also sort of, you know, kind of gives a context to, to how the arts in education have been kind of, you know, being played up or played about. But this, the other thing in there is that suddenly you, you, I found myself in a situation that was very alien because I mean, living in New York and all of that, take it in is, is very difficult. And obviously doing whatever I was doing and the students enjoyed what we were doing because I was bringing in that kind of different approach. But then suddenly with Maxine Green, it was different because that she allowed me, especially looking at her work and reading her work, she allowed me to think about arts education in slightly different ways. And um, knowing her because she was in her 90s still teaching um, and engaging with her work um, was very interesting. And then so suddenly I was looking at her work and I was looking at how people were interpreting her work. She was a superstar. But then I thought they were not looking at, say, for example, the European influences in her because she came from an existentialist thing. Dewey is always kind of, you know, there in, in American uh, education, almost like a totem. But on the other hand, Maxine came from a, a whole tradition which was bringing in, you know, in the 60s, bringing in Camus, existentialist philosophy and stuff. So I got really excited about that. And I remember telling her, I want to write a book about your work because I think that a lot of colleagues are missing a lot of people, even though they admire your work, they're missing out on certain aspects. And I remember she told me, I don't want to know about this, just go and write it. Um, I thought it's not going to be a biography because I don't like doing biographies. I'm very lazy to write biographies, but I want to engage with the work, writing with you, so to speak, kind of metaphorically. And I remember just went out and read, write, wrote it and, um, and she liked it. So, I mean, that allowed me to, to look into, especially reading systematically her work, allowed me to look into very interesting dynamics, particularly, for example, the whole idea of teacher stranger, the whole idea of how um, existentialist, how she brings in an existentialist approach to education and then contrasts it with a Dewey approach to education. So there's a lot there, which is very, very rich. And that allowed me to, to, to also develop a method um, by writing her, the book about, about her or rather with her where I'm, I, rather than I'm writing about, I'm also having my own voice sort of side by side with um, her own, but also reading what she was reading. So that allowed me to read, I had to read systematically things like, you know, Virginia Woolf. I had to read Schutz, which was a great influence on her. I also had to read Dewey in a certain way. I mean, I was brought up reading Dewey as an education student in a very different approach. So that, that gave me a huge, huge um, impetus which, which actually then I wrote a, a book with you, if you like, and now recently I wrote a book on, or rather with um, Ivan Illich, which were different because neither Ivan Illich nor Dewey were alive when I was re writing them. So, I mean, having Maxine and listening to her and uh, listening her, to her voice and all that stuff was a privilege, but also quite an inspiration to, to be able to look at certain aspects of, of, of arts or aesthetics education from a very different approach, which, which really helped me understand also. I mean, Maxine also helped me understand New York. She helped me understand uh, the American way of thinking, especially having to read Dewey with, through her lens, if you like, and all that stuff. So, I mean, and I always tell people, you need to read Maxine because um, don't just, just, just read about her, just read her work, because uh, there are certain books, particularly Teacher, a Stranger, um, Variations on Blue Guitar, there's also a small book called Existentialist Encounters for Teachers, which she wrote by bringing in chunks of existentialist writings and then interlaced with her own comments as if she's having a conversation. The whole idea of the conversation comes from Maxine, basically, because she, in her writings, is always having conversations. Not to mention the fact that she was conversing, um, if you like, metaphorically with, with many authors, because she came from literature originally, um, especially African-American authors, women authors, and all that stuff, which to me was like really kind of a revelation because I realized how much I haven't read um, by reading here. Although I was quite equipped with the European kind of side of things, when it came to bringing in all this American context, I felt that I had um, an advantage in terms of seeing that from a European point of view.
uh, which is something which which also helps being from Malta because we tend to read Italian, French, English, but also we were British colony. So there's that kind of mix of Anglo-Saxon and um, continental um, context, which which you can then bring in. And in America, that seems to kind of work in certain areas. So uh, so that's so it's quite complicated. But I mean, I think you know I would invite people to read not only my book about her, but actually to read her which is, I think, very important, especially coming, you know, this is, you know, this is an audience which comes from dance. She did a lot of work with across arts, the arts. She came from literature. So she would engage with the visual arts and she would engage with dance. And a lot of stuff that she did say in the Lincoln Center where she was considered, where she was, um, you know, professor in residence, so to speak. Um, she did a lot of work with, especially later when in her life, when she was in a wheelchair, she used to do a lot of work with performance artists and dancers on stage. So there would be the dancer performing and then she would be, suddenly she appears on stage and she's talking to or with the, the, the art and the performance. So they're very, very inspiring thing. Um, talking about inspiring, shall we move on to your uh, short presentation mm -hmm. about unlearning, which for many of us, particularly within the dance uh, context or dance education context, becomes uh, a new territory. And I'm, you know, I, I keep sort of um, harping back, uh, John, to we've, John and I've had a couple of conversations about this, um, about finding new ways to converse, to discuss about uh, concepts. And suddenly John's unlearning um, will hopefully trigger some really interesting discussions. So over to you. Yeah, thanks. I mean, you have to time me here because I keep going on forever. I mean, as you know- I will, I I'll time you. Okay, and the, the other thing is, um, you know, before I say this, that, that, that I, sent, you know, I sent you and you, you could share it with everyone, um, uh, an interview which, well, it was written as a chapter, but it was written as an interview between me and Gerd Bista, G or Gert Biesta, Gerd Bista, and he was actually, those of you interested in, in philosophy of education, uh, he's based in, uh, in Edinburgh. He's Dutch, but he was mostly based, his, his work was based all in Britain. He did a lot of work here. And, um, and it's actually that, that particular chapter, it really puts together um, some of the main concepts that I have developed in, in my work. So, uh, especially on unlearning. So anyway, that, I'll mention that. Now I'll uh, try to get this screen share. Mm. There you are. Let me know if it's working or not. It is, yes, thanks, John. Okay, so here we go. Um, I'm using this just as a kind of, you know, to point out, like I wasn't sure whether I should do this, but I'm going to bring in images as well, mostly obviously from the visual arts and some performance, but um, that, that might help. So if we're talking about, about um, uh, unlearning, um, I wrote a book called Art is Unlearning, towards a mannerist pedagogy. And I'll try to explain very quickly what, what, what I mean. So if we think about unlearning, this, this is also linked to, to another book I wrote before, I came out in 12, 2012, I think, um, called Art's Way Out, Exit Pedagogies and the Cultural Condition. So there are concepts here within the concept of, of unlearning, which, which are linked. Unlearning is a concept which comes from, or at least in my case, we use it a lot in when we're teaching studio art. And we, especially when we're teaching things like, you know, live drawing, where we're teaching um, uh, object drawing and stuff like that, is that we always talk a lot about unlearning. You have to unlearn, you know, leave behind, leave outside, if you like, the baggage, the luggage of stuff that you come in with and try to unlearn the way we have been schooled, how to look, how to draw, how to do this and the other. And the process of unlearning is not a question of emptying and then relearning. It's much more... Uh, a concept by which, you know, bearing in mind that we have been schooled in a very constructivist way, and also developmental psychology has become predominant, especially in teacher training. The way we look at learning is that it's, it's kind of cumulative. It's almost like a banking system to use Freire, but even if we don't agree with the banking system where we bank knowledge, even if we don't think about that, we're still actually in a very social constructivist context by which we learn cumulatively. Now, unlearning, especially in positions like this, especially within, within art or the arts, I would say, is that that doesn't work like that. It works in a slightly different way. And so there are elements within that, which I'm talking about exiting, forgetting, which is not denial, but forgetting. And it, this, that's linked also to 
some of the Platonic notions that, and the Rousseauian notions that we tend to kind of come already equipped with all the stuff and we just remember stuff. Uh, forgetting goes against that, so to speak, reverse that. But also issues of interpretation, issues of how we go outside those kind of closed political with a small p um, spaces that define education, but also how we teach without trying to rectify. And this, this is also linked to Jacques Rancière's notion of ignorance or the ignorant schoolmaster, but also a question of manner and paradox. And I will, I will try to explain quickly what this means. This, the, these PowerPoints, I use them for an hour long lecture. So, I mean, um, forgive me if I'm being a bit telegraphic here. So, um, so if we think about exiting, that's the first thing because that relates to my, to the book I mentioned, Art's Way Out, where, uh, and the, the image here is very important because this is, this is the quilting, um, which was done by what they call outsider artists. This was done by African-American women in the South during also the whole, the whole period of, of slavery and, uh, and segregation. Um, there was quilting was a work that was, was an activity, most by women actually, who, which, which was not just practical in terms of making quilts, but also within that there was a whole genealogy, whole history and stories of, 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 um, of families. And, uh, and it was a way of, of, if you like, through art of exiting the kind of closed polity, the, 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 the slavery, if you like, the state of slavery, the state of, of, of unfreedom, the state of oppression. And um, you find that in, in some of these visual mat artistic manifestations and the G's band quilting, there's a whole um, couple of very uh, inspiring um, videos on G's band quilting um, are a very good example of that. But also we can think of folk art, we can think also of outsider art, quote unquote, uh, and how actually, especially with modernity, especially with the avant-garde, art exits that kind of acceptability, that exits the, 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 what, is accept of what is expected of art to do of what the political expectations are. Um, so the, the notion of, ex, of exiting is very important here because it also moves beyond the boundaries. It moves beyond democracy as a closed thing. You know, if you think about democracy uh, for the Greeks, it was those who lived in the polis. Those who were outside were called barbarians or pagans because they were outside and they didn't even have the right to vote. Um, and also inside, if you were a woman or a slave, you didn't vote. So, I mean, the whole idea of exiting comes from there, but it moves beyond art as a form of exiting is important because art seeks to move outside. It also opts to be weak rather than powerful, all, all, all covering, it's canotic. It's a bit like the notion of a canotic faith. You know, Christianity, for example, believes that God made himself a man, a human being, and then was killed by other human beings in order to, to kind of redeem. So, I mean, there's a canoticism, but you find canoticism also in Judaism and in, uh, in Sufism, for example, in Islam and others. Uh, but also it seeks groundlessness. So it doesn't ground us, it doesn't tie us to place, but actually it opens up horizons. So the question of forgetting, and these are points which then lead to, to the notion of unlearning, hopefully it gives you the kind of map of where I am with this idea of unlearning, is, is, has nothing to do with denial. So we're not forgetting the Holocaust, we're not forgetting slavery, we're not forgetting genocide. But actually forgetting here is, is to do with a will forgetfulness. I wrote a paper called Will Forgetfulness which is collected in the book Artisan Learning, uh, which reverses the expect expectations that you'll find in, in, in education, which we still inherit from Plato. You know, the expectation that we, we recall, we, it's almost like as if, and even in Rousseau, it's almost as if we have the ability as human beings to accumulate all this knowledge and keep remembering, keep remembering. So the idea of forgetting is, is, is almost like a metaphor, a metaphor for getting out of that expectation, getting out of those constraints, which means that the arts also allow us to interpret. And through the arts, or the arts are another ability, which we have as humans, to interpret not only the world, but also to, to look at everything as a form of interpretation. This is linked to hermeneutics, but also it's linked to the idea that actually, um, when we make arguments, when we even talk about truth, there is always the, this kind of negotiation of interpretation. Now, I'm not talking about, you know, having alternative truths as, uh, you know, the Trumpians used to say or still say. We're not talking about that. We're talking about the, 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 the power of interpreting, the power of, of also looking at the, at the world in different ways. So, which is always, has always been restricted. If you're a woman, if you're gay, if you're black, 
you're not allowed to interpret. You're only allowed to accept what has been interpreted for you. When we go to school, normally we are, okay, we're given ways of engaging. We're given ways of creating creativity, but normally we get to the, to the idea that at the end of the day, we fulfill what are the standards in testing? What are the standards set for us by the curriculum? Now, if we're talking about art as a form of interpretation, we're, we're reversing that. We're talking about not simply of accepting what is given to us, but actually we are wanting to go beyond that. So we can relate, we can interpret. And the arts are just one, one of those skills that allow us to do that. Um, which means that the arts are not there as some kind of redemption. They're not there as some kind of political instrument to resolve questions because we know this has been tried. And I mean, I traditionally, um, especially as a student come from the left um, and I kind of used to believe very strongly that art are there to liberate us. But if you start thinking about it like that, that kind of narrows down the whole idea, unless obviously that form of liberation means that it's not a redemption, unless it, it means that we're not simply moving from one set of ideas to another and that's it and we're stuck. So there's an open-endedness which goes beyond the idea of, of redeeming someone, the idea of simply liberating someone. Which also gives us the, the question um, of what, what teaching is all about, especially even with arts education. And that the book I mentioned by Jacques Rancière, the ignorant schoolmaster, is interesting because he says that the, the, the teacher is always expected to rectify. You know, students come in, with, with ideas and then the teacher would say, okay, yes, 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 but this is the answer to it. This is, I would rectify. So, I mean, we're always considered as, whenever we, we are schooled, we always considered as somehow there's an imperfection, somehow there's something missing. And what education does is rectify those kinds of things until we become up to standard, we pass our exams, we get our degrees and all that stuff. Um, because we, we correct. Even I remember when I was a kid, we used to call them corrections. So when you send the, the, the copy book to the teacher, the teacher would correct your, your homework. Um, so that's, that's a big problem because actually that we need to unlearn that even as, especially when I'm dealing with engaging with teachers or with student teachers, I try to impress that on them in terms of saying, look, I mean, let's, let's question this. Let's think about it in a different way. And no, I'm going fast and I'm sorry. Now, the issue of manner is interesting because this is where I'm saying unlearning is a mannerist pedagogy. For those of you who, who know um, their history of the arts, and I presume mannerism is not just for the visual arts. Um, there is mannerism in, uh, they say, mannerism in Shakespeare, for example. So, I mean, it, it, it emerges after the Renaissance, between the period between the Renaissance and the Baroque. And mannerism is interesting because in mannerism, there was a point where everyone, after the Renaissance, everyone was thinking, at least in Europe, this is it. We reached the, the, uh, the, the apex, the, the non plus ultra of, of art. Uh, we can't go even more anywhere because we're now perfect. We've got everything right. So mannerists were people who were very skillful. You know, they could paint like, at least in painting, they could paint like the, um, you know, Michelangelo. They could paint like Raphael. But they decided, they made a very conscious decision not to. And they became, became sort of systematically unlearned that claim to perfection, quote unquote, and move somewhere else. And these moments of mannerism happen all the time. I mean, it happened in the Hellenic period, for example, after the Greek classic kind of period. It also happened after modernity, especially with modernity, when if you, a good example is Picasso. People would say, oh, Picasso couldn't draw. Or some of these uh, artists can't draw. My daughter could do that my three-year-old daughter with that, which is obviously wrong um, to say that because um, these artists were making choices which were def definitely choices of unlearning and getting out of that kind of closed notion of what art should be, moving away and not just art, forms of knowledge, forms of everything. So if you, if you look at the period of mannerism or look at periods, say, of modernity or postmodernity, you see that within the kind of mannerist sen sense of understanding of, of engaging with the world, there is an approach to exiting those kind of closed assumptions that have been standardized. They're also the, the willfully becoming a stranger to what you already know. So suddenly what is familiar, you want to be unfamiliar as yourself in order to be able to look at it in a different way. 
So you remain a foreigner, if you like, as in being outside in order to be able to look in and also seek to unground what has been given to you. So mannerists in art, in history with a capital M, but also a sense of mannerism, which you'll find throughout um, the history of thought, if you like, and, and art and whatever of knowledge, um, is, is always trying to, um, if you like, it's, it's very much an embodiment of what, what I would identify with a form of unlearning. And perhaps, at least visually, for me, the best way to understand this is the three pietas of Michelangelo. And if you look at them, the first one, um, you know, on your, on your left, I think, unless I'm getting this wrong, you know, the Roma, the Roma pieta, the pieta romana, which is the most well-known, the finished one, so to speak, is the high Renaissance. So there is suddenly, there is everything is perfected. Per, you know, it's, it's up to, to I mean, you know, perfect, it's, it's considered to be, that's, that's it. You can't go beyond that. The proportions are right. The, the, the bodies are idealized. You know, Christ and, uh, and Mary are perfect, perfect sort of anatomy. Everything is perfect. They, they embody everything that a pieta should embody. The whole idea of, of Mary with the dead son in her, in her arms. But with, with Michelangelo, Michelangelo is one of these unique artists who went through all the periods. Suddenly the second pieta becomes more and more internalized. So the grief becomes more and more internalized and also the whole structure of the perfect pieta goes out of the window. And he makes these conscious decisions to move away from that. And you could see how his, his kind of move into a mannerism, the last one, okay, it's, fin it's unfinished, but you could see where he was going with it structurally and also visually, you could see how, if you like, Michelangelo unlearned Michelangelo himself. And what was kind of, you know, uneducable, what you can't teach became possible. So this, if you think about this, and if you think about the Academy of the Arts, how art was being taught and how, and you can, you know, draw parallels with dance in this through periods of dance or any other art form, you will see this kind of pattern, which is quite interesting. It's a willed forgetfulness, if you like, but also it's a willed um, unlearning. So it's not something which suddenly people became ignorant that they couldn't draw anymore, they couldn't sculpt anymore, or they couldn't dance anymore. But actually there are these conscious decisions as to why art expressions, artistic expression, art forms, artworks change and move into what appears to be quote unquote primitive, what appears to be quote unquote naive and all of that. So, I mean, here again, this is a very speed speedy kind of um, uh, description of what I'm talking about, um, which I hope you can uh, follow in some of these books. And I'm giving you, um, you know, five books here. Um, the first one is Maxine Green's Teacher a Stranger, partly because in, in there, what she's saying basically is, is indicates in the title, but when you read it, it gets really interesting in terms of how the premise is that the teacher becomes a stranger. So the teacher, normally you would expect that the teacher is familiar with what's going on. The teacher is going in there and suddenly you can relate to the teacher immediately. But what she's saying is that the teacher needs also to be a stranger in order to be able to look at the world in a very different way. So, and this is related to Camus, for example, L'Etranger and all, all those kind of existentialist approaches to the world, which question the world in a way that before they were never being questioned. I mean, if you think about, you know, the whole idea of the absurd, the whole idea of, of Sisyphus in Camus, um, there's also the sense of helplessness. I mean, people might say, what on earth is this has to do with teaching? Teaching should be all about hope and should be all about, you know, familiarity, should be all about learning. But I mean, this has been, yes, you can get into learning, get into hope, but actually, unless you start looking also at, at a world outside your comfort zone, you can't get there. And here I'm simplifying this uh, in a very bad way, but the ignorant school master, I think is one of the most, um, you know, pivotal works, which have really shifted the idea of looking of how you look at, at pedagogy, uh, which actually has a historical kind of, um, you know, root. And um, there was such a guy, a guy called Jacoteau, and Jacques Rancière narrates a story. And Jacques Otto was a guy who spoke French and found himself teaching in the Flanders where half of the students were speaking Flemish and half of the students were speaking French. And he didn't know any Flemish. So he was an ignorant 
when it came to Flemish. So what he did is he found a book, Le Fèvre, which was actually in Flemish and in French. And he got that, he used that and threw it in the, the, you know, his teaching. And suddenly people were talking about the subject which had to do with Phaedrus, um, it had to do with all sorts of, you know, Greek myth, but actually they were also engaging in different languages. So by, by being ignorant, they, they also engaged on an equal footing. And in the ignorant school master, there's a lot of argument for what he called the equality of knowledge. So we could come from all over the different places. We can come with different um, knowledges, forms of knowledge. We could come with, with different levels of knowledge. And yet we could still start on an equal footing and engage with each other via, if you like, the privilege of ignorance. And um, again, I would strongly recommend that. So Arts Way Out, the one I mentioned, but also I wish I had time to talk about a bit more about indirect pedagogy by uh, my friend and colleague, Herna Severot, who's developing various lines there, which I'm finding very much kind of engaged with also in parallel with, with, with unlearning. So indirect pedagogy is interesting because again, we are expected to, there is also an argument for direct pedagogy where we not didactically give students what they need to know, but actually how we approach knowledge directly. Indirect pedagogy comes from Kierkegaard when he talks a lot about indirect communication, where he talks about rather than a powerful, meaningful knowledge, which is so big that we have to enter it rather, um, it reverses that. So knowledge is more starting again from a position where we could engage with each other indirectly rather than confront each other with a certain approach to knowledge. Um, and there are some really interesting um, um, parallels in there. In the indirect pedagogy, he discusses uh, Dostoevsky, he also discusses um, Nabokov. Um, and there are some really interesting um, um, literary examples within that, um, which, which actually really gives you a very different approach to pedagogy. And obviously there is this, um, the book I published in 2018-19, um, Art is Unlearning, um, where I try to kind of develop what I've been saying here in uh, 20 minutes. So um, I hope you can have time or you have access to these books, but I strongly recommend any of them. There are other books, obviously, but I mean, these are the ones which came to mind, especially in terms of how um, you could inform a notion of unlearning. And I think that's it.